Uh, now I'd like to bring Tony back up. Uh, Tony is the Vice President of Communications for the National Institute of Automotive Service Excellence, ASE, in Leesburg, Virginia. He has over 35 years experience in the automotive service industry. Tony has held positions at all levels, including technician, service manager, parts store manager, new car sales, and automotive, you couldn't find a job, did you? No, take that. Um, editor writing service manuals for uh, Chilton Book Company. He has authored more than a dozen technical and car care manuals for both professional and technicians and consumers. Tony? Thank you, Charlie. How many people in this room have ever heard me speak before? Show of hands. Okay, then you'll hear this old joke. Um, during that uh, presentation, Charlie mentioned I was a uh, service manager, and I was, at a Fiat dealership back in the late 70s, okay? I have patented my dues. <laughs> Basically, yeah, yeah. And by the way, we prefer, well, never mind. <laughs> Mark's presentation outlined um, eloquently one of the biggest challenges we're facing as, a, in, as an industry. And uh, some of it has been coming for a while. <clears throat> We've been ignoring it, and when it gets here, it's going to be devastating. Um, there are several needs that we have in the industry. Um, one of them, and again, something we've been really haven't had to deal with because we've, we've always had enough technicians to fix our cars. But if you look around any shop, you're going to find that that technician workforce is increasingly getting older. Mark and I are two good examples, I think. We're also facing a lack of real qualified entry-level technicians. And the key word here is qualified. But what perhaps most important we need is, is a pipeline and a method for recruiting young people, um, the right young people, into our industry. It's no secret that our industry doesn't have the best reputation among consumers. I sit on the uh, board of advisors of uh, CS Monroe Technology Center in Leesburg, Virginia. It's got one of the best automotive training programs uh, anywhere. They have an interesting problem. Every year they have 20 slots for about 60 kids and 40 of them are disappointed because they simply can't get into the program. They do end up, by the way, in, in some other programs that aren't quite as good. But that's not really the rule. That's more the exception. Um, I just read the other day, in fact, it was on IATN, if some of you read the Educators Forum, that yet another program has been closed. It is much easier and cheaper for a school district to decide to build a computer lab rather than an auto shop, even though in most instances we are looking for exactly the same type of individual. What we lack right now is a structure for dealing with that. And it speaks to some of the things that Mark was saying. What we need to do is have a way of connecting qualified students with employers, and we have to recognize the fact that the traditional pathways for attracting technicians into our industry are gone. How many of us in this room started working in a repair shop by sweeping a floor at a gas station when we were 15 or 16 years old? A fair number of us did just that. I did. Kind of learned on the job. Can't do that anymore. It's much too complicated. And in fact, many argue that a simple two-year education in a high school program is never going to be enough to get you started. Add to this the challenge that the mix we need of individuals is different. We don't need a bunch of A techs in every shop, but we need a lot of good qualified B and C techs. And we tend to focus on training individuals when they do get into the good programs to a higher level than maybe the industry needs. The bottom line is we simply don't know. And why we don't know is because we don't have a structure. But here's some sobering census data. This is not mine. This is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Right now, 35 million Americans are 55 to 64 years old. How many of us in that room fall into that category? 44 million will be in 10 years, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, that's 26% of the U.S. population within 10 years are going to be between 55 and 64 years old or older, okay? Most of them are baby boomers. And, you know, <laughs> baby boomers make up a disproportionate number of our working technicians. It's worse in the truck market. They're already having a problem. Right now, the average age of the ASE certified technicians, we just found this out, is 41 years old. The median age is 42, okay? 
That's just the ASE certified technicians that we know about. How many technicians are there? Well, according to the BLS data, there are 587,510 auto technicians working in the country. Most people assume that number is a lot higher. I know I did. There's about 130,000 collision technicians. And I don't know why they report it, but they break out glass technicians, so I threw it up there anyway. Okay. But the bottom line is, uh, we normally talk about a million technicians in this industry, and the actual number is much smaller. So it's been contracting over the years, and we haven't noticed it. Cars are built better, they last longer, they need less repair. What they don't need is less maintenance. And if you take a look at the mix of work being done in shops these days, I think, Mark, you'll back me up on this, about 70% of what's being done everywhere, dealers, independents, doesn't matter, is maintenance-based. We have to ask the question, do we still need the same mix of technicians that we did in the past? The answer is probably no. At ASA, we're wrestling with what exactly is a master tech nowadays? Maybe our traditional model, which this year is 40 years old, needs to be re-looked at. Is there a need for these folks? Absolutely. Is there a growing need for these folks? Well, think about this. The average age of the vehicles in this country right now is north of 10 years. We can assume that's probably going to go a little bit higher. You heard a comment about working on uh, cars that are 12 years old right now. What's a 10-year-old vehicle going to look like 10 years from now? Think about all the technology we're dealing with right now. Technology that consumers are buying because they want it. They want the Bluetooth. They want all the connectivity, okay? We need the fuel economy. We certainly have to meet the emissions regs. Who's going to service these things when they go south? Right now, we're not actually preparing the right mix of service people that we need. You've heard that reported from a number of different people in this industry. Mark's one of them. We think we might have a solution, not to the problem, but to how to address the issue, okay? We're talking about a combination of five organizations that now happen to be under the ASE banner. Obviously, ASE itself, NATEF, the National Automotive Technician Education Foundation, you probably are aware of. They've been around since 1983. They basically developed these same educational standards for secondary and post-secondary training programs that ASE does as far as the knowledge base that we've developed, de facto standards, by our workshops through the industry for what the industry says an individual needs to know to be proficient in whatever area of certification we're talking about. NATEF does the same thing for schools. We don't make curriculum. What we do is define what should be in it. We also measure, uh, now are managing AES, Automotive Youth Educational Systems. Neat program, almost went under a few years ago when the car manufacturers uh, had their issues um, because the funding dried up. Two of our board members were also members of AES, came to ASE and said, you know, we think this is a program worth saving. We agreed. So now we took over the management of AES. NACAT, North American Council of Automotive Teachers, an organization that um, helps keep the teachers themselves in the loop. Uh, we heard about instructors that are telling people to probe the big orange wire, okay? That's the kind of thing we can't have, especially at the high school level, certainly not at the post-secondary level. And finally, we've got ATMC, the Automotive Training Managers Council, which is the final piece of the puzzle. This is the group of individuals, like WorldPAC, that provide training to the aftermarket. What I'm describing, ladies and gentlemen, is the structure, okay? A structure that will allow us to find the qualified workforce that we need, but not only find them, provide the standards that we're going to need and the employer connections to ensure that we have pools of qualified talent around the country when we need them that are available locally across the nation. And we have a structure for making sure everybody can work together. It's a framework within which we all can play, okay? How does it work? The Alliance Network itself, again, is a combination of these five organizations that individually work great. The entry-level students are handled by the NATEF system, okay? Also handled by the AES network. AES provides a school-to-work process, almost an apprenticeship program, if you will, through the, uh, traditionally right now through the car dealer network. Part of the ASE Industry Education Alliance is going to allow that same type of school-to-work process to be effective in the aftermarket. Truth be told, about half the kids coming out of AES programs weren't finding jobs in dealerships anyway. They were ending up in the aftermarket. Why not formalize the program, okay? Because it's true. What Mark said is very true. We need those individuals trained 
to the same factory standards that the technicians working in dealerships are. We had a few new wrinkles. AES had a field network of individuals across the country that were helping facilitate the dealership involvement. We proposed to keep slightly smaller, but the same basic idea, a field network, but it's going to engage everybody. We're talking about students to employer connections. One of the bad parts about the current system is we lose about half the kids that graduate from school simply because they either can't find a job or can't find a job that um, compensates them to the level they were expecting or led to believe in school. And you know, my father-in-law worked for Boeing before he retired. Boeing loves to get automotive technology students. They know how to use tools and they're eminently trainable. And frankly, a lot of them are having, coming out of school with a lot more electronic training than they ever had before for obvious reasons. So we're now competing with other industries for the same pool of talent. And again, the automotive technology courses um, can't be dumping grounds. They haven't been for some time. You take a kid who can't handle a basic college prep course, put him into an automotive technology program, you're setting him up to fail. We can't afford to have that kind of waste going on, frankly, in the educational system. But we also have to be able to identify the best and the brightest kids that have an interest in our industry and make sure we don't lose them along the way. What we lack right now is a structure to do so. What I'm proposing is something to create it to do just that. We're also establishing clear career pathways. You know, if you're going to attract somebody into an industry, you have to give them some prospects for growth, some prospects for advancement, improvement. Give them a vision for not just a job, but a career. That's what this organization is set up to do by combine, combining the efforts of all the other organizations I had mentioned. We need to have industry education cooperation. That's exactly what Mr. Warren was talking about. We ag couldn't agree more. But we have to find a way to facilitate that across the board, across the country, and across all players in both the aftermarket and the OEM industry. Again, this is what the structure we're proposing will allow us to do. We also have to consider something that, you know, <laughs> one of the things about having dealership training is great, um, except when you leave the dealership, go out in the aftermarket, and stop learning. How long is that training going to be valid before it's obsolete? year, maybe two. We have to find a way, if you're going to be an automotive technician, you are committing to a, a lifelong learning process. How different are cars this today that were, than they were five years ago? Mark had mentioned points and condensers. I remember when the height of automotive knowledge was knowing how to file a, a, a set of 57 Chevy points with the, stri with the uh, striker of a match pack and then set the gap with the cover because it was exactly the right distance. You, I, you say that to any automotive technology student today, they look at it like you've got two heads. I've tried it, by the way. It does work out that way. They have no idea what we're talking about. Think about this. This is a space of one career. Think about where we've gone. Points and condensers to where we are now with CAN systems. How do you prepare someone? Where are we going to be 10 years from now? Where are we going to be 20 years from now? How do you prepare someone to cope with that level of technological change, that level of technological improvement? Right now, we don't have a structure that can do that. That's what this will do. At the end of the day, everybody wins. Like Mark says, it's in everybody's best interest because what we end up with is a qualified workforce. But there's, again, much more to it than that. Some of the features of this program that I'm talking about are basically involve program accreditation based on national industry and educational standards through NATEF, that's what they do. We're talking about career preparation with school-to-work connections through AES. That's what they do. We're leveraging what each of the organizations does best under one roof. We're talking about the instructor support and development networking through NACAT, which is kind of the glue that holds everything together because the North American Council of Automotive Teachers is an organization for all automotive teachers, not just those in post-secondary and post-secondary educational programs. Aftermarket teachers are welcome to join as well. It gives them a structure, it gives them a framework for keeping up just like we expect their students to do and making sure that they're receiving the latest information that they need on what type of curriculum the industry says they need to be teaching to make sure that the other end of the pipeline, we have an employable individual that is going to be able to provide the skill set that we define that we need for the right mix within the shop. We're talking about in-service training and best practices and trainer networking through ATMC. That exists today. We're talking about making it broader across the board. Not enough organizations are involved. But it's a very, very powerful um, network, if you will, again, to keep the trainers in the aftermarket up to the same speed that we're keeping the trainers in the educational system. And finally, you've got the individual professional certification through ASE. 
taking it back to NATEF, okay, ASE, with in cooperation with Skills and a few other organizations, AES, one of them, created an end of, of program test, if you will, that we're looking at, at turning into a, an actual student certification. It's called NA3SA. The na acronym stands for the National Automotive Standard Student Skills Assessment. It is a better measure, if you will, of a, of a school program's function and, and their effectiveness than having their kids take an ASE test, which was never designed for kids. It was designed for working technicians. The bottom line is, again, it's the first step of a process where a student comes into a system where we're going to be able to track where they go, communicate with them throughout their career. My CEO says cradle to grave, I prefer end-to-end -end career management. But the idea is you're going to have a process for the first time, a communications network, where you can stay in touch with an individual all throughout their career and not only help them find the training they need, but let them know what they don't know. How many times have we said that in this industry when it, with respect to training? We'll be able to, to keep them abreast of what they need to know, what training they're going to have, and most importantly, make the best and the brightest aware of the opportunities because you know we are going to need some ATEX too. And we want to make sure that we're training the folks that are going to be able to excel at that because training is just too damn expensive to waste. It's important for everything to be cost effective. The only thing we can't do right now, the only reason we can't do it right now is because we don't have a structure, we don't have a, a method of measuring all this. You know, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And that's exactly what this does. What we end up with is a nationwide pool of qualified entry level technicians. Enhanced recruitment opportunities for employers, connections with students, instructors, and technicians, a field network for direct contact and support, customized hiring strategies because the network will also allow companies to participate and, and find the exact type of students they need or the exact type of, frankly, working technicians they need for their operation, trained to the proper level. Again, it's right fitting an individual's skill set with the jobs that they need. We're talking about um, something that actually is going to showcase the leadership and industry education partnership between the aftermarket and the OEMs. These are the five organizations, ladies and gentlemen, that are, are going to help us provide the structure that I've described. You've heard Mark talk about uh, service readiness. This is one way to ensure that we have a structure for letting individuals know, again, what they don't know, what they need to know, and providing a structure we can all work in, both aftermarket and OEM, to make sure that, A, we're not losing any qualified students that we, we find, we're keeping the in-service folks trained to a level where they're going to remain effective regardless of how automotive technology changes, and we're doing it essentially in one framework that will allow the industry to cooperate in a way that frankly has been demonstrated eminently through th organizations like ASE for the benefit of everybody. It's called the Industry Education Alliance. It's going to require the support of both OEM and aftermarket uh, manufacturers and participants in the industry to survive, but actually we're starting to see the, uh, the beginnings of that as well. AES has been supported for years by the OEMs. That support recently was ratcheted down. It's coming back up again and the aftermarket is stepping up to help provide this too. We've already had commitments from several of the aftermarket uh, manufacturers and parts suppliers actually because they see the value in this program. It's something we think we need, it's something we think will help address the uh, issues that we face and we hope that you will, uh, you will find some time to participate in it as well, both as employers, manufacturers and trainers. Does anybody have any questions about anything I just presented? Okay. Thank you very much. Before I turn it back to Ron, I just want to mention that you've seen Mark's presentation, you've seen Tony's presentation. And I think the point I want to make is, is that if you take the OEM involvement that Mark is asking for, put it under a structure that actually needs to go beyond just your own organizations, by the way, Tony, uh, and include some other organizations as well. And what you kind of end up with is what Mark Saxonberg has been preaching all along, which is, you know, under a program that he has affectionately called ASAP, which some of you may or may not have some information on. But the concept is all the same. It all works together. And the concept is that we are one repair industry, 
not two separate ones, and that you want to be able to support your vehicles from when they're built to when they go into the crusher. I'm not even sure that's going to be allowed in the future. But when that happens, and in order to do that, it's going to take everybody in the industry to do it. And if you combine efforts, and if you do a good job at it, there's money to be made by everybody, and you end up with a happier customer at the end. So that's kind of the goal. That's where we're headed. And you can get an, a, an idea about that. So you've got some great ideas here, and I think they need to be combined into a single effort. And that is what we're hoping we can accomplish. With that, I'll turn it back to Ron. Call to action. Yeah. Actually, there is a call to action. And uh, right now, ASE is working uh, to finish, finalize that field network. And by the way, I did neglect to say something Charlie, Charlie mentioned. Um, this is an open architecture, if you will. Anybody can play. In fact, we need to have everybody engaged in it. All we're doing is providing the connections, basically. But what is the next step? ASE is moving forward with establishing the field network. We're finalizing that. What we need to do. Um, is to when you get the phone call uh, from the representatives of, of either AES, any of those organizations I mentioned, take it, set up an appointment with them. Um, we are going to need support from the industry in order for this to work. AES needs financial support to survive just like NATEF does. And ASE has been covering a fair amount of these costs over the years, but it reaches a point, we're a nonprofit organization too, it reaches a, port, a point that without industry support, it simply is going to, we're going to be unable to do it. Um, we like to think it's a great starting point, if you will. We're providing a structure, but it is by no means a, a, a done deal. It, it's basically a work in progress. What we'd like to see is some feedback on what you've heard here today. Give us your, your thoughts on what, what can we do to enhance what we're, what we're proposing here? How can we make it work with every different segment of the industry? How can, can you participate, whether you're in this room, on the phone, or out there? What we're going to be doing moving forward, again, is going out and, and getting that level of feedback uh, from the various manufacturers, from the aftermarket players, to find out how we can make this uh, even more effective for everybody in the industry. And of course, we're going to be engaging the instructors. Um, and frankly, we're going to be talking to a lot of the technicians and students to see just what they need. So again, through our partnerships with organizations like SkillsUSA, we're trying to establish the knowledge standards that we all know, know we need. But we can't establish those standards without feedback from the industry. So again, I guess the next step, Mark, is, is tell us what you think of the idea. Tell us what, how we can move forward with it. And if anybody has any thoughts on how best to proceed, please let us know. Does that answer the question? Well, how do we solicit feedback? That feedback from the right people in the right organizations is what Mark said. I'll tell you how ASE does it. We basically talk to people. We hold workshops. Um, the workshop model has worked very well over the past 40 years for establishing the, the uh, standards for the certification process that the industry um, has developed through ASE. It works pretty well with the um, educational community through NATEF. Um, AES was built largely on the feedback from the manufacturers as to how best they want to structure the program for bringing students in through the dealership network. And in, again, what was essentially a closest thing we have to an apprenticeship program in the U.S. But what's been happening up until now is these things have been happening kind of in little silos. The idea now is to mix that information together. How can we make these things work across those lines of demarcation that have traditionally been there simply because we had no reason to change that? Um, things have gotten too complicated, uh, things have gotten, frankly, too expensive for us to do it alone anymore. Uh, there's too much to this puzzle. Uh, the fact that a consumer can get their vehicle serviced where they want to properly and repaired is going to make as much an impact on whether or not they choose that next same brand next time as it is us having technicians in the shop knowing how to deal with that vehicle. There's lots to this equation. And I think that, that one of the first things we need to do is recognize that, again, we're all kind of in this together. And there's benefits up and down the food chain for everybody if we can find a way to cooperate for the good of all. It's not easy for competitors to cooperate, but we do it all the time, as was pointed out. Did I hear you say that maybe you're willing to have a workshop? Absolutely. ASE would be willing 
ASC would be willing to host any meeting, any time. In fact, we have a beautiful new conference center um, that is set up for just such a thing. Um, and in fact, uh, we've used that on more than one occasion uh, to recently rewrite the NATEF standards to better reflect what the manufacturers are telling us they need in the way of students uh, with, the, with the right level of training. It, it's, it's unrealistic to expect a student coming out of a two-year program to be trained up to a level um, beyond what is probably just a basic maintenance position at this point in time, realistically. It is also unrealistic for an individual to come out of a two-year program, go on to a uh, automotive technology program, and essentially bump into the same curriculum you just had in high school. So things are changing at that level as well. The question is, we, are we doing it correctly? Well, the workshops tell us where to go and what to do. But it's always nice to have a reality check from the industry and the people that are actually working out in the field. We stand ready to open that dialogue. We stand ready to host those meetings. In fact, if you come out to Leesburg, we'll show you the new space shuttle. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I think one of the, uh, the obvious uh, pieces of the puzzle uh, to make what Tony's uh, organization is uh, attempting to do work will be an emphasis on the priority at the management level. There has to be a recognition, and I think Mark touched on it, from every shop owner in the country that investments in training are essential and not just something you do uh, when you realize you can't accomplish a particular job or your ATEC does leave and then you're hung out to dry. I think it has to be a, a methodical approach, a professional approach where you address it you know, annually, cyclically, so that you are developing a trained workforce. And I am here to tell you that a lot of folks just don't make that commitment. And it's really haphazard and it's uh, delivered spottily. And I think one of the uh, key elements of uh, a commitment of that nature is uh, just essentially drawing it uh, to everyone's attention as a huge priority. The uh, statistics that Tony presented are compelling. Uh, there are not enough uh, technicians, uh, particularly of the type that we, we know we're going to need. And uh, obviously the attrition rate is, is increasing. Uh, there's folks that are in this room that are my age bracket that realize that, you know, we're, we're uh, going to be dependent on folks that uh, currently are, uh, you know, just in uh, bassinets somewhere, and they really don't have a clue what their career path is going to look like. And uh, honestly, uh, I have a, a, a two-year-old granddaughter, a uh, two-year-old grandson, who both are proficient on using my iPad to do a lot of different things, including communicate uh, with uh, text messages and email at two years old. Now, you tell me what their, what their career path is going to be uh, when we talk about uh, our industry becoming more complex. We want folks like that. And uh, I'm not going to train them. Uh, I'm going to be too old. But uh, somebody in the room is going to have to assume that responsibility. And somebody in the room is going to have to be the shop owner that says, we really need these folks and we're going to commit money and resources. Resources are scarce. Anyone doubt that? Anyone have any issues with that, that statement? So marshalling the resources and consolidating a lot of the efforts that are going on in the industry is essential. I think part of our problem is that we're too fragmented. And obviously I really appreciate Charlie's vision to really continue this dialogue about uh, the aftermarket and the OE uh, interest are common and uh, launching uh, this particular conference with uh, that dialogue on the front end because I think it's essential. How many people uh, look at their business in the room today, we've got about 60 people or so, how many people in the room today, primary business interest is OE? Raise your hand. You really don't do a lot with the aftermarket, but your primary business interest is OE related. How many of your primary business interest is aftermarket related? So, you know, it, 
and there, there's some in between, I, I assume, that do both. But, you know, honestly, uh, NASTF is a good forum for that kind of interchange of information. And we certainly believe that that may be uh, uh, part of our, our ongoing uh, evolution as an organization is to be more of a conduit for that kind of exchange. And we want to take that seriously. So the feedback uh, that Tony's looking for, the feedback that this organization is looking for, is about telling us what you believe the opportunities are, what you think the unmet needs may be, and how we can uh, be a, a good facilitator, if you will, of those efforts. Uh, I think we all understand that uh, it's not going to be, uh, we're not going to be repairing cars the same way uh, in just a, next year than we were last year. So let's, um, let's take those responsibilities seriously. And let's leave here with a renewed commitment that we are not going to just pay lip service to this. I think uh, that call to action is about education, training, and resource management. It's about how to make our, uh, our repair world more effective, more efficient, and honestly, more relevant. Uh, it just has to become so. Any other questions before we adjourn our session today? Anybody want to share any thoughts? This is an open uh, forum kind of session. Go ahead. No, no, I'm not. Not unless, not unless, you know, I, I really believe that the industry is going to make that kind of commitment. Honestly, honestly, you know, what would you say? Okay, let's all look at it that way. What we really want to do is we want to change the perceptions, don't we? You know, I've got, I've got kids and, and sons-in-laws and, and, uh, that are involved in this business. And every one of them, I, I'm proud of them, and I think what they're doing is really productive and additive. And, uh, you know, one is a service manager. One is a, uh, works in a, in a parts distribution company, and uh, some, other have, some of the other kids have ancillary roles in the industry. But I will tell you that that's not what their peers are talking about. That's not what their peers are gravitating toward. So, you know, how do we make this more attractive? How do we make it more exciting? How do we make it more professional? Because that's what people are really asking. You know, well, what's the career path? What will I end up doing? How interesting will that work be? Uh, my perception of your industry is not necessarily the most positive. So that's what we have to do, and I think ASE and other organizations are uh, doing their best to address that with limited resources. But we know that we operate within one of the largest industries in the entire world. Why aren't we marshalling those resources and using them more effectively? It's a really good question for all of us to think about. Anybody else? That was real personal, Karen, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I would, but only if we become what we know we can be, right? All right, with, uh, with that, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Charlie, for hosting. Appreciate you. <laughs>